Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our second of five talks about fluidity. We're looking at the flow of life, how we feel it in our bodies, how it moves in our relationships, and how it's central to the natural world. We're also talking a bit about trauma and how it can obstruct the natural flow of life, leading to rigidity in body, behavior, and society. We live in a fluid world, and our bodies, as parts of that world, are also fluid. And as we face the world, circumstances flow toward us, we respond to them, and then they flow into what we call the past. Some of these circumstances have a comforting and pleasurable tone, and our bodies respond with feelings of comfort and pleasure. Others have a challenging and harsh tone, and our bodies respond with feelings of stress and discomfort. All of this is very natural. These feelings that our bodies provide in response to circumstance help us respond to what life serves up in ways that promote our well-being. But some of the harsher and more challenging circumstances can become pretty intense. And when they become very large and begin to feel like they're beyond our capacity to cope, we start to talk about experiences that are called trauma. And as mentioned in the first talk of this series, one effect of trauma is to block our natural fluidity and lead to rigid patterns in body, behavior, and relationship. Well, fortunately, there's a lot that can be done to work with the effects of trauma. There are many professionals who specialize in the management of trauma symptoms, and there are a lot of books available as well. This program can provide some skills that may be useful in conjunction with other work on trauma symptoms to restore normal fluidity. The approach is one of learning to move awareness into a broader range of bodily experience. In the last talk, I defined four so-called bodies of experience that differ from one another in key ways. They are the objective, mammalian, cellular, and universal bodies. I briefly introduced what each of these mean in the last talk, and starting today, we'll go through them one by one with each of the remaining talks. Thus, today, we will focus on the so-called objective body. Now, the objective body is a product of our very powerful human intellect. One way of looking at this is to say that the intellect removes itself conceptually from the body and then looks back upon it, as it were, as if the body were something separate, a kind of object that it can examine. And not only is the body as a whole seen as a kind of object, but so are its various parts and functions. Thus, I can look in the mirror and define my eyes and my nose and my mouth. What's more, biologists can go much further and look at individual cells and individual parts of cells and functional systems like the cardiovascular or respiratory systems and so on. So the intellect is very powerful in its capacity to act as an objectifier and define an objective body that we can talk about conceptually. And this can be very useful, but there are also ways in which it can get us into trouble. I think we're all aware that a lot of objectification of the body serves to create stress. And that stress can arise when we feel like our bodies are inadequate in some social sense. They're not attractive enough or strong enough and so on. So some of the objectification can be positive, particularly when it leads to medical advances, and some of it can be much less positive 
when it leads to a sense of dissatisfaction with the body. Now the objectifier is so good at its job that it is continually defining different categories. And when I talk about the four so-called bodies of experience, I'm using my objectifier to map out different types of experience that are discernible in our bodies. And of course, I didn't come up with this all on my own. I'm basing it on other systems, including the kosha system from yoga, which is to say I'm basing it on the work of other people's objectifier activity. So this objectifier is a huge part of human mental life. And as I've said, it can be very valuable, but it can also be harmful. It's important to understand that the objectification is often, in fact, probably always, somewhat arbitrary. While it is possible to discern these four bodies of experience that we'll be discussing, the distinctions between them are not sharp, and it would be easily possible to come up with a different system of categorization. And so it's important to keep in mind that our actual experience is one of continually changing and blending experiences. And yes, we can pick out different categories and name them, but those categories are not strict and solid features of reality. They're useful tools that help us get a handle on the world we live in and how to respond to it. I'd like to now move on and explore the ways in which the objectifier gets us into trouble. To do so, we can bring our intellect back down into position where it actually resides anatomically. And we can also compare the objectifying function and the objective conceptual ideas we have about the body with the actual felt experience of having emotions and sensations, which is to say having what I've called the mammalian body. So when we live in our body, we sometimes feel experiences of harshness and distress that kind of jangle us. We often think of this as a mental phenomenon. You know, I have anxiety, I have fear. But of course, a lot of what we call anxiety or fear isn't just about what we think, it's also about what we feel. That is to say, it isn't just a product or a feature of the objective body, it's also something that resides within the so-called mammalian body. So if I feel fear, I may have fearful thoughts, but I'll also have a feeling of racing heart and tremor and maybe some quavering in my voice and so on. What I'm feeling then when my body is anxious is a kind of agitation in the body core as well as in the muscles, in the limbs and so on. So the body, the mammalian body, with all of its organs and sensations and emotions is affected when we're anxious or fearful. Now these two processes, what we think about, the fearful thoughts, and what we experience, the anxious or fearful feelings, are of course related, and they feed off one another. And we can get in a kind of cycle where I think a fearful thought and I have some racing in my heart and some tremor and some uh, sense of uh, impending doom in my body and so on. And then I feel those difficult sensations and think even more fearful thoughts. And then those additional fearful thoughts are having an effect on my body and they lead to more bodily discomfort. And the cycle goes around and around and around and we can begin then to talk about something that could be called suffering, because now I'm really caught in an unpleasant cycle where my thoughts are negative and my feelings are negative and then I have negative feelings about the thoughts and so on. Well, to break this cycle, it's going to be helpful to look at it from a more biological and, as it were, objective perspective. But before getting to that, it would be a good idea to stop the recording at this point 
and just spend some time in a meditation noticing how your thoughts can lead to feelings in your body and the feelings can influence your thoughts. You could think of something that happened recently that felt a little bit stressful and notice how your body responds and how that affects your thinking. And then you could reverse directions and think about something more pleasurable that's happened recently. And likewise, notice how your thoughts and your feelings interact. But we'll move on now. So looking at the two layers of experience of thought and emotion, we can begin to devise some strategies for breaking negative cycles and rigid patterns. To do so, we will first look at the brain in a very simple but important way. Now, in the interior of the brain, there are a number of structures that taken together comprise what is called the limbic system that I believe most of us have heard of. So the limbic system could be referred to as the emotional brain. Some of its structures are pretty well known, and you have probably heard of the hippocampus, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and so on. The limbic system is in close communication and cooperation with the organ systems of the body. And that's why when we have emotions, there is such a strong component of feeling tone in the body core. So we can place the limbic system above the organ systems of the body core, which of course is where it happens to reside anatomically. And we can look at what happens when challenging or comforting experiences come our way. So when something challenging happens, we tend to feel activated. Our heart races, we get more alert, often our digestion slows down. What's happening within the body is that blood is being shunted from the digestive tract to the large muscle groups, the heart is being stimulated, the brain is being placed on high alert, and so on. Some of these effects on the body are the result of activity in what's called the sympathetic nervous system. So this is part of an autonomous component of the nervous system that functions beyond conscious control. And the sympathetic nervous system is the one that comes on board when we're threatened in some way. It's closely related to a glandular response of stress hormones, such as adrenaline, and cortisol. So when we are confronted with challenging experiences, we get activation in the sympathetic nervous system and we get the release of stress hormones, all of which serve to activate the body and prepare it to fight or flee. Now, the sympathetic nervous system and the stress hormone responses come into play also when we're exercising vigorously and even during phases of the sexual response, which is why there are nerves that go down into the genital region. But characteristically, this is what happens when we have challenging experiences. When more comforting and pleasing experiences come our way, the body responds differently, as we all know the heart rate tends to slow, digestion tends to ramp up, and blood is withdrawn from the large muscle groups. We also feel calmer, our breathing slows, we feel more relaxed. Part of this is due to activity in the so-called parasympathetic nervous system, which effectively counterbalances the one we saw earlier, the sympathetic. Nerve fibers run throughout the body core, particularly in the vagus nerve, and serve to create feelings of ease and to promote restorative functions in the body. 
Simultaneously, there are hormonal shifts that create feelings of restoration and promote harmony. Thus, when we're resting or having calm, pleasant activities with others, we will go into this mode of parasympathetic restoration response. And meditation can certainly lead to changes along the same lines, and that's one of its benefits. What we have in effect is an emotional region of the brain the limbic system that can alter its tuning according to circumstance. So if we're in a situation that feels harsh and challenging, the limbic system will tune in the direction of sympathetic activation and stress hormone release. And if we're in a situation that feels safe and supportive, it will tune toward parasympathetic output and the release of soothing restorative hormones. And if we're in a more neutral situation, it will simply wait in the background in order to fluidly respond according to what arises next. That fluidity of response is, of course, a very helpful and adaptive capacity. But then we have these situations that are quite powerful and threaten to overwhelm our ability to cope. And that's when we begin to talk about trauma. And one effect of trauma is to lock the tuning of the limbic system over in the sympathetic and stress hormone mode. Now, this is, of course, an oversimplification. The body and the limbic system will retain some fluidity, but there will be a strong tendency to be extra reactive and hyper responsive to reminders of anything remotely related to the trauma. And there will probably be a background experience of ongoing stress. Fortunately, there are tools we can use to soften our trauma rigidity. We can release the lock on our limbic system so that it isn't continually activating the sympathetic nervous system and driving the release of stress hormones. One of the tools that we can employ is the objectifier function of our human mind mentioned earlier. Because that function looks back upon the body as if it were a separate object, it creates an experience of separation, of distance from what's going on inside the body. So that when I've suffered trauma, and when my nervous system is in a state of relative, constant, sympathetic, and stress hormone overload, and I'm feeling a lot in my body, feeling sinking sensations perhaps in my belly, a racing heart, tightness in the throat, tightness around the mouth and the jaw and the eyes and so on. When I'm feeling all that, I can look back upon it from my objectifying conscious mind, taking a witnessing stance and observe these sensations with a sense of distance and separation. This allows me to disidentify with what's going on in my body and mind and to feel somewhat free from all of that turmoil, all of that noise. So that some of the trauma rigidity is thus dissolved. I can take things further by, in addition to focusing on what I'm feeling in my body, to remember the sources of those feelings to know that they arise from past experiences, not from the experience of the present moment, but from a deep memory held in my body of something that happened in the past. And I can know that 
there is activation in my sympathetic system, that my stress hormones are probably elevated. This information can allow me to see what's going on more objectively, to not feel so lost in it, to not feel like it's so mysterious why I'm so upset, and so on. I can understand that my body is trying to protect me, even if it's protecting me against a threat that has long since passed. That further dissolves some of the lock trauma has on my system. There's something else the conscious mind can do, which isn't connected so much with its objectifier function, but instead with its ability to remember and imagine. So that I can bring to mind pleasant memories and even pleasant imaginings of times with a lover or a beloved pet, or when I was held in my mother's arms as a little one, or when I held a sibling or some other young child when I was a child and we were playing together. I can remember pleasant, connecting, warm touch, the nearness of a loved and safe person. And those memories or those imaginings will alter the tuning of my emotional brain, of my limbic system. So that I not only have the memory of comforting experiences, but I'm also shifting my physiology, moving from sympathetic activation toward parasympathetic regeneration and changing the profile of neurochemicals away from stress hormones toward hormones that promote feelings of well-being and affiliation. Most of us have had the experience of getting in trouble because of our human mind's tendency to get locked into rigid patterns. The objectifier can get locked into a mode of criticizing our bodies, for instance, leading to feelings of dissatisfaction and shame. Our memory systems can get locked into patterns of replaying painful memories over and over. And our systems for imagining can lock into fearful expectations of worry and dread, imagining horrible things that might happen. But each of these can be turned around and used in service of dealing with the difficult situations that come our way and softening trauma rigidity. So that when we feel locked in after some difficult experience, either recently or a long time ago, if we feel locked in a pattern of stress and activation, we can use these tools of mind, and in particular our witnessing function, to soften that rigidity and to lessen our stress, to reduce the sympathetic activation, to reduce the stress hormones. So the mind is very powerful, and the witnessing capacity allows us to mindfully resolve some of the difficulty that comes our way. Now, we also, of course, have times when life meets us with more pleasant and agreeable circumstances, and the parasympathetic nervous system sends out feelings of ease and restoration, and we have these affiliative hormones released, like oxytocin, and vasopressin, and, and endorphins, and so on. And we might be tempted to say, well, okay, we can use the power of our mind to lock in these pleasant sensations. And actually, that's possible for a little while. But it tends to become a kind of stressful and difficult effort as time goes on, because what we're really doing is blocking the natural fluidity which life is all about. It's like we're taking the organic life around us and locking it in amber, making a kind of fossil out of it. 
and that will not feel pleasant and comforting and supportive for very long, even though it might look convincing to other people and maybe even uh, to some aspects of our own consciousness. But on a somatic level, it's working against the natural resiliency and fluidity of the body. So we want to let the pleasant experiences come and go in the same way that we let the more difficult ones come and go. Again, it's a question of letting everything kind of flow to not insist on sharp boundaries and artificial categories or to lock things down into a particular configuration, to let them blend and move and change as life does. It's when we are most fluid that life feels richest and most meaningful. And that doesn't always mean that it feels pleasurable or easy, but we feel most alive and most engaged. And that, of course, is what life is really all about. So we're near the end of this second of five talks about fluidity. We've examined the so-called objective body and seen how the powerful objectifier capacity of our human minds can get us into trouble and also help us manage difficult experiences. With time and practice, we can begin to use these tools to soften our rigid patterns, especially if we combine this work with other methods for growing and learning and healing. Next time, we'll look in more depth at the so-called mammalian body, that body of emotional experience, of passion, of feeling. Thank you for watching.